Hello. Um, somebody in the comments asked me um, to record a video on how I got started making clothes and stuff. So I'm going to start by saying that my grandmother is the reason for everything that I do. And she died in 2002 at 98. But my grandmother never graded. She never graduated from, I don't even think she went to middle school. But as a grown up, she did after she had my mom, my mom is her only daughter, her only child. After she had my mom, she uh, moved to New York and she did day work. And basically that means you cleaning either poor people houses or rich people houses. I don't know which, but she was in, she was living in Queens, New York. And I've never been to Queens, Manhattan, yes. So anyway, when she had her stroke in 72, uh, my mom had her come live with us. So 72... I was young so I might be off on the date but I know I was like seven years old when um, she taught me how to she tried to teach me how to cro croquet I think I'm saying it right uh, crochet she tried that because she could do anything my grandmother did everything not well almost everything so she did the crocheting she did the knitting and she did the sewing so I didn't realize how valuable the gift was that that she was giving me because um, at seven, when she was teaching me, the first thing she taught me was how to make a quilt. So you basically put two pieces together, sew it down the middle, and then add another piece and you sew that. Until next thing you know, you got a whole blanket. So I didn't do the blankets. I did like those throw blankets that go over your knees. You know that, you know, people be having in their house when they get cold. So <clears throat> I did that. And then I guess once I was good enough um she moved me to um now i didn't physically make this stuff but she taught me i would sit and watch her i was the only one out of six grandkids i was the only one that took the time to listen to her stories listen to when she told me that she you know back in north carolina because that's originally where she came from back in north carolina and my grandpa that she you know had to walk up to the top of the hill to get the water out the well like i remember all of that even now so I would watch her make curtains by hand. I would watch her make drapes. And she showed me like how to put the loop, how to put the uh, the hook thing in there after you make the drape. I watched her do blankets and, and, and well, other than the quilts, blankets, sheets. Um, the cooking, no one taught me how to cook in the household. My mom either did the cooking or... My grandmother, my brothers ain't have to do nothing because they was men. They ain't have to do nothing. But I was the only one in the house that before my grandmother, no, after my grandmother came, I was the one that was responsible. So I had to cut the grass. Uh, I had to do the dishes. I had to wash the clothes. I had to keep the house clean. Like I literally did everything outside of what my grandmother had me doing. So when I became... I was in, I went to Catholic school. I went to Catholic school for the first eight years of my life. And then prior to that, I went to Edgar Allan Poe. But I don't know if I was there for music. I remember saying something to my mom about, because back then I was real good with writing um, short stories because that was part of our curriculum at the, you know, at the Catholic school. So I remember going to, my mom taking me to that school that boys and men went to. I don't know what happened, but I had to write like three or four stories for them, you know, in like a copy book or whatever. But my mom never told me what happened. So I don't know. I'm assuming that they didn't take me because, you know, I didn't go there. So I only went there for the, you know, the interview process. So then, um, like I said, I watched my grandmother do everything. She was so good that, and, and keep in mind, she was old. She was like 60, 70. So... My grandmother never left the house. If she needed something from the store, I would get it or one of, yeah, I would get it because I don't think my brothers did anything. The one time I saw my brother doing the dishes, I took a picture because I was like, this is history in the making, you know, because they literally didn't have to do anything in the house except go to school and go to work. That was it. So anyway, I would go to the store for her and um, she never left the house to go anywhere except to go to the doctor. So... She would either have my mom or my oldest sister take her to the store afterwards. My grandmother was so good at making clothes, she would 
all she had to do, she had like a photographic memory. So all she had to do was look at the outfit, you know, check it out in and out. And she would come home and she would make her dresses or she would, she would have those, you know, how the old people be having those magazines. They be getting all their clothes and stuff. Cause you know, they don't go outside no more. So she would order all her, she would look at the stuff and she was like, I ain't paying for that. So she would look at the stuff in the magazine and she would make it. So I would either go get the fabric or my mom, not my mom or my my oldest sister so my mom my mom ain't teach me anything come to think of it she ain't teach me anything and i'm just being honest i'm just keeping it real so i am traumatized but i'm not traumatized well maybe i'm gonna say about two percent i'm traumatized because her having four daughters she didn't tell us anything about what to do and what not to do in life, like not to get pregnant early, you know, to wait till you get married. No, none of that. My mom worked full time. My mom received money from the state, okay, cash and food stamps, and she didn't spend none of that money on us. Of course, I didn't know that then. I found out like when I was like 40, 41. So, um, this thing is kind of tight. So, my mom. I used to always wonder because we always, my godmother, she would always take us to the church. So I thought that the church was, because, you know, when you, you're stupid, when you're, you know. So anyway, when you're a child, not every child, but, you know, I was one of those dummies. So my godmother would take us to the church and the clothes would be piled up to the ceilings and they would be like, take whatever you want. I remember my mom buying us back then. They were called, um, they were called jelly bean sandals or jelly bean shoes. And they literally was made out of plastic. Them joints was $2 in the store. Okay. And my mom brought all of us on. Everybody in the projects, everybody everywhere at that time was wearing these jelly bean shoes. And it was best. Remember, they were sandals, like I said. So it had holes and stuff. It don't matter. It's plastic. So if you're wearing these joints and you ain't got no socks on with it, your feet is kicking and your feet is like, your feet is sweating. So it's slippery when you're walking, you're trying to walk and your foot is sliding. You know what I'm saying? That's when I had small feet. So uh, by the time I was, uh, by the time I was in eighth grade, I think, or or graduating out of eighth grade, I think I was a size nine. But anyway, back to the, uh, the sewing. So the whole thing was the issue with my mom so my mom had a whole wall because i hated living in that house i was so i didn't know then the word but i was depressed so my mom had like a whole wall of books all the way up to the ceiling right we had the full encyclopedia i read that drawing like maybe 10 15 times i read every book that she had on that shelf because that was the only way that i can spiritually if you want to look at it like that i can spiritually leave my body leave my body i forgot to put my phone on do not disturb so i can spiritually leave my body and put myself inside these fantasy books or whatever type of book fantasy side fiction uh you know stuff like that i read all the dickens and uh, what was that all the poetry because i do poetry too so uh, I need to start doing that on here, too, because it's supposed to be a D. Well, I can tell people how to do poems. But anyway, so I did all of that, and I had to clean. We had a fish tank. We had a talking parrot, okay? We also had a pig. Why do we need a pig and we in the projects? We ain't on no damn farm, but we had a pig. We had a, we had a talking parrot. Like, I still can't wrap my head around that. But anyway, once I became a teenager, I fell back. I stopped doing the you know, the, the, the quilts, because I had made everybody in my family the little throw, you know, the little throw blanket. So when I became a teenager, because we lived in the projects, and to go to middle school or go to high school, we had to walk like 30 blocks. So my mom never gave us car fare to get on the bus. So I would make oatmeal cookies, because that's when I was starting to experiment, and I was like, you know what, I need some money. And I ain't know about banks and stuff like that. I ain't had no job. You know, I was a teenager. It was like 12, 13. So I said, um, let me do the oatmeal cookies. So they was the size of my hand. And I would sell them drawings at school for like 25 cents, right, a piece. And I would paint, um, I would paint like Popeyes on the boys, at the bottom of the boys' uh, jeans. And on the girls, I did strawberry shortcake because when I was in Catholic school, that's the type of stuff that they had us drawing. 
So that's how long I've been drawing. I've been drawing since I was maybe six or seven years old, from what I remember. And um, I did have my, my pictures. I don't know what, I still had the same uh, pictures of the, the Catholic Church, pictures of Popeye, Strawberry Shirt. I have no idea where they're at. So I might do another look. Cause, but anyway, so I did that so I can make money to get to walk. Because I was tired of walking those 30 blocks. And back in Philly, when it snow, the snow at that time, the snow was all the way up here. And, you know, regardless of what everybody say, skinny people get cold when it's snow out. When they got to walk 30 daggone blocks to get to school. So, um, cause back then, it wasn't no, oh my God, it's snow flutteries. You know, we're going to let all the kids stay home. No, it wasn't none of that. It was, you want to take your ass to school. It was simple as that. So, um, so after I did that, then I said, okay, well, it's time to escape from my mom's house because like I said, I hated being there. And the fact that I, I felt like I had to do so much effort and I was getting bullied at school, like the kids would throw M&Ms at me or sandwiches, whatever, whatever the hell they had in their hands, they would just throw it at me. So, uh, but I didn't know that that was bullying at the time, but I just was like, why do they keep throwing stuff at me? <laughs> So, cause I ain't know no better. So when I turned, I was getting ready to turn 18 and I said, man, I'm about to get out of this house. Somebody told me, or either I seen it in the newspaper cause that's when daily news was everywhere. They inquire, everybody was reading the paper. We ain't had no internet. So that's what everybody was focused on. I remember we had black and white TVs. If you're not over 40, you don't remember that, that you had, that your parents might or might not have had, depends on their income, a black and white TV. So I'm getting to be... 18 and I seen the job corps join and I said, oh man, that's my ticket to get the hell out of this house Then I could do because you know as kids we like oh man, we don't like the rules. We don't like this We don't like that. Oh, I can't wait till I t until I get grown I can't wait till I turn 21 so I can curse or so I can drink so I can do this and do that What your parents don't tell you is that once you become grown You might only got to listen to your mom and your you know Your oldest brother and sister if you have one and you got to listen to your grandparents but once you become grown, it's a whole list of people that you got to listen to. You got to listen to your boss whenever you get a job. You got to listen to your landlord. You can't be having people all up in the house, getting high, having parties, damaging the property. Um, you got to follow the rules when you're on the bus if you ain't got no car. You got to follow the rules if you do have a car so you don't get into an accident. It's like almost 20 people that you got to listen to once you become an adult, right? So... I saw the thing in the uh, paper. Uh, so my mom signed. She took me there. And this is the first time. Once they accepted me, this is the first time my mom actually spent money on me. She brought me a pair of Adidas. And she spent like maybe, I'm going to say like $100. She spent like $100 on me. So um, I get to the little uh, the center thing. And <laughs> I, thought, I thought they were sending me to California. Because I was like, man, I'm going to get to California. I ain't going to look back. I'm done. So, of course, I get that he was like, California? No, we can't send you to no California. You're in Pennsylvania. This is where we're, we're going to send you there. These fools sent me up to, uh, they sent me up to the mountains. So, I was like, damn, man, I'm still stuck with these people. So, that's where I met my son's father at. And then, um, me and him, I guess you want to say we hit it off. And then I would go home with him instead of going to my mom's house. And I would go and stay with him at his aunt house because his mom died literally like two weeks after I met him. She died. She had an aneurysm. So back to the sewing and the art and stuff, I didn't start that until I was common law married to him. Back then, that was a thing. Um, you can be with a dude. You ain't have to marry him. And then if he died or you died, he can get half your stuff or you get half his stuff. But in 2004, they got rid of that joint. So, this is after we had already broke up, but I had already been with him, let me see, 80, no, 88, 89, 90, 91, 90, so like five years, like a job. So, I was, <laughs> I was with him like five years. So, after I broke up with him, because I was in the I hate men mode, I was like, okay, it's time to go back to doing the painting and all this and sewing. So, I went and got me a sewing machine, the old behind singer machine that come up out of the desk. Oh, God, that sewing machine was horrible. It, ain't, it was not computerized. It didn't have any of that stuff. So 
I said, well, I, I want to start going out, going to the clubs with my girlfriends, my, you know, my girlfriends from Job Corps. And I would hang out with them, but I would make my own spaghetti strap dress. So mainly they was black or either like a burgundy, you know, it was between those two. So that's what I would make. And the first two or threes, you know, they, I couldn't even get into them. And I was skinny. I was like 135 pounds. So suffice it to say, when I found out that my kid's father had slept with all my girlfriends, that was it. That's when I cut him off, which was one of the reasons that led to me breaking up with him. And then my girlfriends, how you want to smile on my face every day? And this is what you did behind my back. It's a golden rule. And guys, I don't know if y'all agree with this, ladies. Um, I when I when I'm friends with a woman. I don't sleep with her brother, her uncle, her father, her cousin. I don't sleep with anybody in her family, male or female, because, you know, people just go both ways now. And I'm not going to let them, I'm not going to even put myself in a position to even be alone with them. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be drinking with them. I'm not going to be getting high with them. I'm not going to do any of that because people be like, oh, well, you know, we got drunk and things happen. No, don't put yourself in that position. So, once I found all of that stuff out, that's why I said I was on the I hate men thing. So that's when I started doing um, the clothes. And then I said, okay, well, I was on welfare. And I said, this was, you know, with my first son. And I was like, they was giving me like, I think like $400 in cash and like $200 in food stamps. And then um, before we broke up, we had, you know, relations again. That's how I got, you know, my second son. So... My second son, I was planning on getting an abortion, but I, his dad, my son's father, his dad had a stroke. Because remember, his mom had already died like two, three years, four years before that, you know, when I first met him. So his dad had a stroke and the money I had saved up to get an abortion because people was telling me, oh, you got to do it like the first two months, two, first two or three months. So when he said his dad had a stroke and he was going down, I was like, I am too. He was like, oh, well, I don't have enough money for you to get on the bus. <sighs> I used the money that I had for the abortion. So I ain't had no choice but to have my, you know, my second son. So then I got my tubes tied after that. So back to what I was saying about me getting, you know, getting back into the, the art and stuff. So to, to have extra money, like a side hustle, if you want to call it like that, they had, um, like at the dollar store back then, everything was a dollar. So they had little statues that you had to paint yourself. So I would spend like, when I got my money and paid my bills and stuff, I would spend like $50. So I would get like $25 worth of statues, go to Joe Mar or either go to, uh, I don't know if Michaels was out back then. But anyway, I went wherever I went and I got the paint and stuff and I would paint these statues and I would pay the churches and the libraries. Like at that time, it was like $10 for the, for the space, but you had to bring your own chair and your own table. So one day, this guy, I had two big statues that I was selling $25 a piece. And remember, these are all bone. You have to do all the paint and the eye design, all that stuff. Sometimes I let my kids help me, you know, because they was like maybe six or five when I start doing the, um, the flea market. So um, this white guy came and he was like, how much? And I was telling him like, you know, $5 for the tiny ones, which were, you know, about this big. And then the big ones were 25. And he was like, I'll take all of them. He brought everything. I was so happy. I was so happy. Okay. And then, cause I always stole stuff like bars, you know, everybody had a bar in their house. That's when I was still drinking. And then, um, uh, the, I would sell like, TVs, VCRs, wasn't no DVDs out then, uh, wasn't no internet, wasn't none of that stuff, no flash drives, we had floppy drives, so I went from doing the art to going back to doing the sewing, and then I remember about the quilt thing, but I was like, man, that's like a lot of work, I don't want to do the quilt, but again, I didn't know how valuable it was that she, you know, taught me that, because quilts today are expensive as hell. Like, if I ever go back to that, I'm just going to make it myself. It'll probably take me, like, a whole month, but that's what I'm going to do. So, I, I started doing the, uh, the designs on... I got to upload the pictures. I started painting... Um, I started... We're just going to have to picture this as a, a glass vase. And I would paint, like, designs and stuff. I'm going to upload the pictures later for y'all to uh, see it. But I would um, paint those and paint um, anything that I could make money off of. So I would do like, 
paint on sneakers. I would paint my purses. I learned because I had so much free time on my hand and I didn't want to fool with no man. So when my kids slept at night, I was up all, literally I was up all night. So I would paint sneakers. I would make purses. I know how to make book bags. I can literally, if you give me a picture or some type of like a video or something, I can make it. But I kind of fell back because when I was selling that stuff, my my friends was always, oh, well, can I get the friend discount or can, you know, can I get the, the black person discount, like stuff like that. Or one person even offered me food stamps to pay for my stuff. I'm like, man, no, like I'm not going to do that. Like, I still have to pay, just like your job. You're not going to go to your job and say, well, can I get my money today? Knowing that you have to work two weeks depends on the job that you got. Unless you're doing a day-by-day -day job, you know you get paid every day. But a regular job, to my knowledge, is you get paid every two weeks. Unless you're on salary, then it's once a month. So, I used to, I can do hair. I know how to do micro braids. I know how to do weaves. I started making my own wigs. I started making my own wigs like two, let me see, because I was in Cal I lived in California from 2004 to 2006. So I started doing my wigs after that because I wanted to look like the other girls because I was a follower back then. I didn't know my own self-worth. You know what I'm saying? I, because I lived, because I wasn't taught anything when I was in the household by either parent, you know, and... I had to fend for myself. So I thought that if I did this and this, if I did certain things when I was having relations with a man, if I did this, then he would like me. And if I did this, if I, you know, give my girlfriends free stuff or do their hair for free, they would like me. I, I done did all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? Trying to appease other people. So from then, um, I went, like I said, I was doing the wigs, but I had stopped doing everything else. So I just did wig, 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 and I kept doing it over and over and over. So in Philly, in 2006, you can go to the wig store. We had the internet then. You can go to the wig store, and they would have, like, used wigs. You know, like ponytails like this, or they would have, like, a half a wig or a full wig. It wasn't no lace fronts yet. So I would buy, they was $10. I would buy, like, $50 of them. And then go buy the hair because all the colorful, because they always at the at the hair place, they always got the real cute designs on the mannequin because they do them, the Chinese people, they glue them joints or either they get the girls to do it. They glue them joints on themselves. And when I say, oh, well, I want that color, they'd be like, oh, well, we don't sell that color. Then why the hell are you advertising it? Like, so I wasn't dying here back then. I didn't learn to dye hair until... I moved here so that was like three years ago so and I gotta upload those pictures too so anyway um or video I don't know but anyway so I just did the, the wig thing and then people said oh you do wigs oh okay so how much you charge and I said oh well I just do it for myself I don't do it for people and they was like why I said because nobody's going to pay me what I want I'm not going to charge you if they're if they're charging you for a full weave because everybody was doing the weave thing back then. They was gluing, getting that joint glued and they was the edges was coming out, all that stuff. And that's when I stopped. I was like, let me go ahead and do the wig because when I come home, I can just throw that joint off, throw it on the floor, throw it on the bed, throw it on the couch. And the wigs, I mean the weaves and the sewing weaves or the gluing weaves, you can't do that. You're stuck with that hair. So you're sweating everything. They ain't had no central air or nothing like that. So I was telling the lady, like, if they charge you $300 to do your hair at the hair salon, I'm going to charge you $150. Because number one, my time, and number two, shouldn't I get paid for it? And if I'm supplying the hair, I got to charge you more. Because it depends on if you want synthetic or you want human hair. This is what the Chinese people call it. So I don't know if it's real human hair or not, but there is a difference. I know when I used to do the synthetic, my face would break out, would have bumps all on my cheeks and, you know, my chin and stuff. And I never knew that I was breaking out from the synthetic. And then when I realized that, that's when I start doing the wigs and I stopped doing the weaves and the glue and stuff. Everybody had finger waves. I know how to do that too. Whatever you know how to do with the hair, the, the, uh, the dreadlocks, I did that for my kids. My youngest son, his hair was so nappy. I couldn't even, the comb got stuck in it. I couldn't even comb his hair. So I was like, okay, 
I've learned to adapt. So I said, okay, well, let me go to the library, get a book, and figure out what can I do. And that's where the dreadlocks thing came from. So I did my hair, and I did his hair. I didn't do my oldest son hair because he had that type of Indian hair. Because in my family, is black, white, Indian, and Irish in my family. So, and that's mainly on my grandmother's side, you know. And then my grandmother's great-great-grandfather was a slave, but that's a story for another day. So, now I'm going to have to jump the story. So, now I'm doing these. I went to college. I went to the, uh, I went to the Art Institute first, but I was doing online art. I wasn't, like, in person. I was only doing it online because I wasn't living in Philly. I was in PA, but I wasn't living in Philly. I was in Levittown, which is part of Philly, uh, PA. So, they taught me how to do vector art, which is, to me, is the hardest type of art trying to click that daggone mouse to get the lines and the hearts. Everything got to connect. That is so I give props to everybody who mastered that because once my year was up, I was out. I was like, no, I'm good. So then I went to um, to the community college, and I went there in person. That's how I learned how to make my own, how to make my own canvases, where to buy the the fabric for the canvas so you can get this anywhere from home depot lowe's and it's like twenty dollars and it usually lasts me a year it depends on how big the picture is but um and then you have to put gesso on there because you have to prime it just like when you painting your house you have to prime it. if you're painting your car the same it's the same thing so you have to do the same thing to the canvas and back in the day you can get gesso like a gallon or two or three gallons, I'm trying to remember. I know it was a gallon or something. You could get it back there for like $10. Now you get a little jar like this that don't even do half a picture this size. It's like this size for like $15, even if you go to Hobby Lobby. And Hobby Lobby is like the thing to go. You know what I'm saying? So on this picture, the painting and the dude, the, the rose petals and all that stuff and the, the beads and all that stuff, this picture cost me about $70 just to make it. But if you include the fact that I had to do my own canvas, I'm going to say 100 just to make that joint. And then people be like, oh, well, you're charging too much and you're doing it. Uh. So I just do that. And when I was in college, I learned how to do ceramics. So I know how to do that now. And I was all I was the student that was like, oh, my God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know. I only took it because I was getting loan money and you have to take a certain amount of classes, you know, to get the loan money. So. I was like, well, I got to do what I got to do. Because, like, I tell my girlfriend all the time, you have to learn to adapt. I'm a survivor. And I never even realized that until, like, a couple months ago. I was like, look at all the stuff that I've been through. Look at all the things that I know how to do. I don't know any woman who has the skills that I have. And when I say it to men, they be like, oh, well, the other girls, they twerk. My, my grandmother used to always say, you ain't got to never worry about going hungry because you can sew. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't even doing hair then. But, you know, after becoming, you know, an adult and then being in a relationship and then not being in a relationship and then the internet came out and all these girls are twerking and stuff, if you're not doing the same thing that these other women are doing, most men don't want you. Most men, if you're not doing, they don't want you for that either. They don't want you if you're not doing that. So, I've met countless men over the last 30 years. Because I'm, I'm over 50, so, and their response is always the same. We are visual creatures. We go by what we see. We don't really care about if you got wigs on, eyelashes, you got your nails done. I can understand that because that doesn't make a person, you know what I'm saying? I said, well, I try not to let other people define me because I know who I am now. Because I have had all these struggles. And this little stuff that I just told y'all, that's like 10%. <laughs> That ain't nothing compared to, look, that ain't nothing. I can't even do the whole thing on here because, oh, wow, I'm at 30 minutes. I don't know if anybody going to sit that long, but um, I hope y'all do because then y'all know a little bit like where where I come from and why I do the stuff that I do. But men nowadays that I come across here in Jacksonville and in Philly, their main thing is, oh, you got a big butt. I want to have sex with I mean, I didn't mean to say that. I want to be with you. Um, you got boobs. I want to be with you. So that's all they care about. They don't care about your personality. They don't care that 
They don't care that I used to be a truck driver. They don't care that that I worked literally everywhere. They don't care. I didn't have every job. I didn't work at every fast food. Not Crystal's, not KFC, because it wasn't out yet, and not Wendy's, because it wasn't out yet. But I have literally worked. I've been a supervisor at Bryn Mawr College in Philly. I've been a uh, floor carer, a person, I can't think of it. I've been, I worked at three airports in my life. Uh, United Airlines sucked. And I worked at two in, uh, two in, two in Philly, no, three in Philly, and one in California, when I lived there in California. But I'm gonna end this video because I done ran my mouth for 30 minutes. So I hope that this explains some of my life. That's the best way. And I did these. This is also a, a basin. It's only the top, the, the um the bottom. But this is the uh this is the bottom part. Cause I ain't want to talk to y'all with just my underwear on. So I was like, let me go ahead and grab my um. But there's a a, a top that I made with this because as I started gaining weight, like once I stopped getting high and stopped smoking cigarettes, I was like, oh, so that's why I was skinny. I couldn't gain no weight. I was eating everything. Soon as I stopped participating within the next five years, I was this size. And then, you know, some of my exes, they would come and they'd be like, oh, you look so much better now because you're plus size. And like, what kind of crap is that to say to somebody? You know what I'm saying? Like, just people just say anything out of their mouth. But anyway, this is the second one I made. The first one is in my, is on my dancing movie reviews, 22. I'm dancing in that, on that one, you know, the, that was the first one I made, which was the burgundy and yellow one. And then this was the set, these are just the shorts, not the top. So this was the second one. So I know how to make bathing suits. I know how to make thongs. I know how to make underwear. The only thing I haven't mastered is bras. It's so tricky and I don't like the wire. Oh man, when you become plus size, that wire be cutting all in here. And all of this be numb because of wire. I'm so glad they got rid of wires. But I tried to wear only sports bras. And the day that I become rich, I'm getting my boobs lifted and I'm in debt with that.